No, my hearty, my time for caucus. Uh, the meeting is underway. Today's episode, we're going grumpy. Not us. We're a very unified, positive, and are we? Um, yeah. well, you should you should have well, heard us off here. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, <clears throat> no factions or spills yet. Anyway, um, but uh, this week's Chris Hipkin, Hip, Chris Hipkins it's prediction. It's hard when they're all practically got the same name. Yeah. So no. Chris Hipkins yeah. prediction of a grumpy campaign has really much come true. We've got um, crimes against candidates, people making stuff up, mountains out of molehills, chickens, ghost leaders, all kinds of stuff. Um, And with voting underway, we're also going to look at strategic voting and some of the things that we may have missed so far this campaign. But let's start, guys, with psychoanalyzing this grumpiness that we're seeing in the party right now. Um, Seems that the public, for a start, are getting quite fractious. To the people who ram raided my house, who came into my house and threatened me, to the people who came and vandalised my fence, don't be scared because the Kohanga Reo generation are here and we have a huge movement and a huge wave of us coming through. I am not scared and I am not fearful. Maipi Clark from the Māori Party there. That was your debate, mm. Julian, that you were hosting. Um, quite a revelation, the crimes that she's been facing. Yeah, oh, so we, we, we got a text at 6 o'clock from her father, who's a good mate of mine, uh, Paul Tucker Maipi, from a reporter, who said, look, we're at the police station, we might not get there till 7.30, debate starts at 8. And I immediately said, is everything OK? And he said, oh, Hannah Rafferty's house got, got raided again. I went, what? Again? And then he said, look, I'll, I'll tell you all about it when we get there. When she gets in and she's, you know, just done a report to the police, she's obviously quite emotional. And I said, um, your father said you got raided again. She goes, oh, yeah, it's the third time in the last couple of weeks. Um, and she talked about what happened. And she said it was a ram raid. Certainly someone had been in the house. There was a bit of ransacking. Someone had, had done a bit of stuff with their fence and all that kind of thing. Um, and we've seen since then, of course, a trespass A trespass. As well. a, a, a supposedly they followed this person who came into the house, actually, and got busted by someone who was there. So they put someone in the house whenever uh, Hunter Rafferty's not there, it's in Huntley. And when she's on the campaign trail, if I know, member stays in the house. They've also got CTV cameras, and so John Tamahere has said that they've got footage of this guy, they followed him to his house, he's got National Party hoardings, that's the accusation that John has said, and he's made the police report. She's 20 years old, she turns 21 in a few days, actually. She had her 21st earlier, and I gate crashed it, just to bring some levity to proceedings. But anyway, um, she is a fairly strong individual, she's named, actually, after the lady who presented the Māori language petition to Parliament. So she's not fearful. However, uh, you can see this has had a major impact on her. During the debate, and Nanaia Mahuta went up to her and held her by the shoulders and just said, are you OK? Mm. And she said, no, I'm all good, auntie, because, you know, they're related through her father. And Nanaia said, I know what you're going through. Mm. Just kaka. And looked after her through that debate, and they, and, and they actually found support in each other, which is great. But um, this is not the only time I've heard this. You know, I was talking to... Uh, well, Jean Prime, there are five people who follow her everywhere she goes. And if every time she gets out of the car, they're, they're giving it to her, both right. barrels. Um, you know, there's others that I've heard dipping out of her packers that the same thing happened to her signs and people approaching her on the campaign trail because she's the co-leader, not that she's the Tatai Hawaii to electric candidate. Is, is there something here, though, guys? I mean, we've been around a lot of campaigns. Home invasions is one thing, but signs, people following her around, is that... Normal? How? Where, where's the line here between what is robust and relatively normal, and and what's going on now? Yeah. Well, what Julian has described is obviously well over the line. Yeah. Is um, despicable behaviour. You, you always get. Um, I mean, it's a time-honoured tradition in New Zealand to destroy political hoardings, <laughs> um, and sometimes it's funny. Um, so the you faces know, we, we, between we, other student parties. Yeah, cut out we can't. So we can't get too precious about that. Um, but w- what Julian is describing there is is obviously well, well over that line. A, a lot of the other stuff you you, you see about um, you know destroying billboards and that sort of thing is the sort of stuff you see in any campaign. But but that is well, well over the line. And it's, yeah, it's way over the line. And obviously we heard from um, uh, a Labour MP who said she was slapped mm. about the face yep. as well. Mm. And, and, Roberts. Yeah, and, and that, that, that the guy grabbed her by the shoulders and gave her a, a shake. I mean, and if this day and age you do not realise that you do not touch people in that way without permission, you don't lay hands on people like mm. that, and that is more than just a sort of, how you doing, Tim, I'm tapping you on the shoulder. That's aggression. Yeah. It's utterly inappropriate. And what you saw there is 
utterly inappropriate that she is having to um, toler- tolerate or go through that. But and I'll tell you what, that, I just want to say, yeah. that was so powerful. That, to me, sort of harked back to those, um, you know, that passive resistance civil rights campaigning where you say, don't be scared. Yeah. Don't be scared. I'm not scared. We're the kohanga reo because, generation. Because the aggression comes from fear, not from yes, power, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I yeah. just thought that was a remarkable moment. It made actually the hairs on my arms Quite stand tingly. up. I'm yeah. tingling now just And, just, and just, just I that. thought, wow, that is an interesting approach where you can meet aggression with aggression mm. or you can actually say to them, hey, you don't need to be scared of yeah. me. And, and look, it's it's fair to say, and it's probably important to say, that that prompted a whole bunch of um, other claims from across the spectrum. And we yeah. hear from Chris Bishop. The behaviour that they have, our candidates have experienced on the campaign trail has been disgraceful. There's been death threats, there's been people having to move house. They've had, uh, one of our candidates has had a, a headhunters member filming them when they're out for dinner, sharing it on their, with their followers on social media with an abusive and intimidating message. We've had several volunteers just on the weekend just gone, followed by gang members in Hawke's Bay and abused. Um, it's been awful, frankly. We've had to hire private security for specific candidates who have been threatened. So it's across the spectrum. We were talking about this earlier in the week, Guy, and we, 2020 was the COVID election. But this is still a little bit of COVID election. It's the pandemic strikes back, the sequel, right? Well, it is, and that may well be um, one of the factors which has led to this this grumpiness. I mean, obviously, we saw the, a rise in conspiracy theories, a rise in, um, you know, attacking politicians and, and just a, a rise in mental health issues. Mm. Um, and that was probably w- one of the factors. Um, yeah, it's interesting that, that Labour won in 2020 off the back of COVID and, and, and this time in a, in a piece of uh, fairly cruel symmetry. Um, Chris Hipkins, the previous COVID minister, yeah. has been laid low with uh, with the virus at, at home. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, that that hangover from COVID, which has affected us all, the lockdowns and just the stress, um, may well be a factor in this. We've seen this aggression offshore, though. I mean, America mm, is the true. case in point, right? And it... And it it's unacceptable, and I, um, I, I don't know exactly what is driving it, but it's this idea that people think that they can get up in your grill like that. Yeah. I mean, you don't always agree with people. There are robust debates. I don't have a problem with that. No. But physical aggression and intimidation is utterly unacceptable, and I think it's interesting that a number of the people who have been subject to it are, um, are women, yeah. MPs or candidates as well. Yeah. Um, it's not appropriate in any circumstances. Mm. But I, I just, I don't know what has made us. I can guess, but I don't know what has made us Do you think so COVID, angry I mean, as a country. It was interesting. I hosted a debate this. I mean, you, you guys were all involved in, in big in, in big TV debates. I did a, um, a local um, candidates debate this week. And the first question from the floor was a woman saying to the Labour candidate, "You, why haven't you apologised yet for that second lockdown in Auckland? You, The businesses you put out of, out of, out of business, the families that you ruined. There, there's still, especially in Auckland, I think, quite a residual anger about that, isn't that? Which I probably hadn't picked up on until this campaign. Do you think that's fair? Do you see oh, I, that? I think there is residual anger around that, but there's there's a difference between having residual anger and then um, aiming that at someone in a real physical sense. Sure. You know, and acting on... Um, Acting on those feelings in a way that translates yeah. to violence or violence threats. Yeah. But yeah. it's part of this, this COVID thing is part of what's actually got. I mean, Labor's position now. A lot of the issues that they are, they have have been the rod to beat them with yeah. are still COVID issues, right? Crime, yep. <clears throat> education, insurance issues, um, debt. Yeah. You know all of that. Uh, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that um, there was someone who was pretty close to Labor who is now very much in New Zealand First camp who said that they don't realise the damage that they have done, and and this is in the north. They're they're from the north. Right. They were saying they don't realise the damage they've done and the, the amount of people who actively will oppose Labour and they were essentially hinting at the way that Winston was going to campaign. This was 18 months ago and it's it's born out, it's been borne out that way. And to come back to the point that Lisa made about the direct attack uh, of, of women uh, it is absolutely true and it's, and it's been prevalent in the North and I'm not too sure what has driven it either. The attack I think on Māori women has actually been driven by, and this is just my view, by the co-governance campaign argument debate that's mm. happened with Julian Batchelor and that crew, which targeted Nanaia Mahuta, and she's still feeling the effects of that. So I think that's part of it, 
when we look at what's happening potentially with someone like like Hana Rafati. Um, you're right, I think a lot of this is residue of what's happening overseas. I thought we were a bit different as a country, but the fact that we're still dealing with COVID issues has really impacted the way we do our politics now. Yeah, and no. it, it could stay for a long time, which is the most unfortunate. Well, that's right. That's the difficulty, isn't it, is getting it back to that uh, level. I mean, once you do away with the more walkabouts and the freedoms that we have to go up and ask our politicians about this or the next thing, mm. it's, it's hard to return to that that time. Mm. So y- yeah. I mean, at the moment, we're discussing a feralness among <laughs> the constituency, right? Yep. But I do have to say, the, um, I mean, things ratcheted up within the players themselves. They reduced themselves to um, a common denominator, one would argue, um, this week. Where I mean, there was so much, well, shit-slinging, yes. you know, back and forth. <laughs> right. um, claim and counterclaim and real sort of... <laughs> you, know, that, you know, it was kind of... It was like, hello, no, who's it was, in the sandpit now? It was, it was sandpit politics. And, of course, we have some examples to play. So let's, let's hear from Labour first. He is running scared from the debate. It looks like he's being slippery. It looks like he is chickening out. <laughs> that is utterly infantile and stupid. Point. Pretty infantile and stupid, you've got to say, in terms of calling each other chicken. But then, to be fair, Chris Bishop didn't himself any favours <laughs> um, in terms of claiming the high moral ground. I think that's an easily justifiable proposition because you, you have now got a succession of Labour Party uh, candidates and MPs public, publicly advocating for positions uh, that are different to the Labour Party policy. Take home point for New Zealanders is if you vote for Labour, Greens or the Maori Party, there is going to be a wealth tax or a capital gains tax or likely going to be both. To explain that, the first, that first grad, the proposition that Chris Bishop was referring to was the idea that Chris Hipkins would be rolled um, at any moment by his, own, by his colleagues. On the basis of this comment from um, Ingrid Leary. The wealth tax for the top 1% is absolutely what I would support. I would also support a capital gains tax, but I support my leader and Labour will not be doing that wealth tax. Well, that's not the yeah, I it's mean, a lot of stretching going. Well, on, it, it was, it was, but I would say, and and they put out a press release, um, yeah. which I see you've helpfully brought into the studio. <laughs> um, Labour MPs will roll Hipkins. Well, you know, obviously that's just not true. But but I would say that that was pretty ill-disciplined yes, um, from from, and there was another candidate who did this too, and so they got a couple of them who've been running around public meetings saying, "Oh, I would support a wealth tax." Now that is very poor discipline it's in, in a campaign. It's just, it's just flat out sloppy. Yeah. and and there's been but, um, but Labour... they all have. Spies, right? So they have. You always have someone from your team in a, in a public meeting right. who's going to who's going to shoot the information straight back. Yeah, but, straight but back. Labor's going to introduce a wealth and, and likely both the capital gains tax as as as, as likely as national um, change in abortion laws. You know, they this stuff gets ruled out and then it just keeps coming back. Yeah, right? but but to have your candidates, you sure. know, potential MP, all it does doing is that. it just keeps drawing attention back to where there was a division in a party over a policy that some, you know, yeah. um, held very strong feelings Yes, because it was two senior ministers, yes. Grant Robertson and David Parker, yeah. both so, so really they, supported it. Yeah, so. they absolutely supported it and then by just bringing it up, what you're doing is just referencing that division within your own ranks. Not not helped by the fact that C, the CTU... Um, you know, Council of Trade Unions, uh, sent out this bulk email, Helpful right? Yes, no, too. so did I. I printed it on bigger papers because I considered it to be big news, so I went A3 all the way. Um, you know, and there was a list of things on that sheet of paper that they said, you know, um, that uh, things that National wanted to remove, they said. That was the expression they used. Other achievements National want to remove. Ten days sick leave. We need a buzzer. Uh, incorrect. National has said that it's not going to flick that policy. Free prescriptions, half a truth. So they'll give free prescriptions to people with gold cards, the community service cards, and anyone else will only pay up to $100 annually. Cost of living payment, they want to get rid of that. Well, that ended in 2022, so sorry <laughs> folks, it's already gone. Um, and then what were the other two at the bottom? I think winter there was payment, another... The winter winter payment? Winter payment? No, they're keeping that. Yes. And then Although there was... ACT does want to... Re- does, does want to yeah, but we're that. talking so about could... national no, no, policy. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't like... say in that line, national no. and no, it says national. No, and not. then it says, it talks about um, the paid parental leave at 26 weeks. Well, um, National has a different policy to Labour on that. So they will allow um, partners share. to share share that leave. But to put a list up like that and saying that they're, um, they're basically pulling the carpet out from beneath those policies is absolute tosh. And it, it undermines 
your credibility. Mm. And it makes people question whether they can believe anything you say. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, yeah. and both of them have been guilty of it. I think you're right in the fact that um, I think lots of people in the Labour Party still actually want a wealth tax, even though publicly that's not what they're saying, they and do. some have let it slip. But they, they wanted it. Everyone knows yeah. they wanted it. And he made a captain's call, Chris Hipkins made a captain's call and, and ruled it out. But if and you want right. to, I mean, if you want to think long term with, with that, the logic that Bishop is, is yeah. putting out there, in a way you would vote Labour this time to get a Labour leader who is opposed to a wealth yeah. tax in rather than actually and, wait. And, and then Six years, you're likely partners. to get a Labour Party Both who, Labour who, Party who probably tax. does want a wealth tax. And a CGT and a GST <laughs> of all right. uh, fruit and veg, which they say the wealth tax will pay for. So you're absolutely right. Um, I do find, you know, it's always kind of interesting uh, when a national rolls out Chris Bishop to, you know, answer some of these questions and, and, and respond. He does so in kind because we all know what Chris Bishop is like. And sometimes he can't, uh, he can't help himself. Look, I, I thought the chicken thing was actually, um, you know, infantile and, and he's right. Um, but then the way that they responded to that, and it just came, seemed to keep the conversation percolating along. It was mm. a snowball yeah, gathering yeah. momentum. It kept going and going like, and bigger, going. Bigger. You know. And look, and I guess and that, you know, while we're giving concessions here, um, uh, Chris Luxon could have made space in his diary, could have fronted up. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a crazy construction to put on it that somehow, um, because your man had COVID and the debate couldn't go ahead, that the other guy's a chicken. And people should know that in Parliament, for as long as I've been covering it um, for many years, on a Thursday uh, on question time, the Prime Minister's never there, right? Yeah. Mm. They're always travelling around the country. The leader of the opposition is never there. It's always chief to chief, yeah. every time. Yeah. So the idea idea that then Luxon would somehow um, debate someone else from Labour, that's never going to happen. It does. It's considered money diminishing. Well, yeah. it is, and you can understand that, um, because I- I- you can't really win in that situation, no, can you? Right. Because yeah. if you win the debate, you've only beaten the number three or whatever, and if that's you right. lose it, then, oh my God, you've lost to the, the number three. The apprentice beat you. So, you yeah. know, it, rightly or wrongly, that's always kind of been the tradition or the co-papa really in, in, in Parliament, I- I- even right down to question time. So I, I just thought it was a, it was yeah. a silly and, and there is no, st- there's no strategic interest in, in Lux and turning up to another debate where, you know, you're, you're 10 points ahead, you're yeah. looking pretty comfortable. That's right. What's well, the... in less than two weeks out, I mean, yeah. it's a busy time, right? Sure. I know they've got the TVZ leaders debate next Thursday and, and there'll be a poll there. But so so he would have to do some manoeuvring around, but you're absolutely right. There's nothing on him to be able to turn up no. to a debate. I There's mean, nothing in it for if, him. If he'd pulled out of the TVNZ leaders, yeah, exactly. that, 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 that would yeah. be worthy of a chicken suit. Yeah. But you, you, <laughs> raise, you raise the point about um, Chris Hipkins with, with COVID, though. Uh, you know, you remember when Anthony Albanese got COVID. COVID and you know he wasn't having the best of campaigns at the time that he got COVID. It actually helped him in the end. Scott, <laughs> Scott Morrison, I almost called him Scotty, sorry bro. Uh, Scott Morrison uh, ended up not doing himself a, a great service at the time that Albanese was out of action. Now, well, I'm not trying to draw the, draw the two together and say that there will be suddenly a great positive impact for Hipkins because he's got COVID and he's off the campaign trail for five days. But his latest public performance was that TV3 debate, which generally speaking everyone said he won. He's got COVID, he's laid down. Maybe the perception in the public mind is, oh, he's done okay, actually. We might give this guy another go. We haven't heard anything else. He hasn't blurred his copybook. In the meantime, everyone else is slinging all over the place and Luxon's been drawn into it. Well, the poll certainly hasn't given him that. They don't. No, there's, there's, no. There's, there's been stagnant. a poll this week. It's it, Labour stagnant. Um, but National was also stagnant in that poll. Um, and... Uh, Winston Peters and New Zealand First are again sitting above the threshold, which is what, as we know, National has been begging the public not to give them. Um, and so this is in the context of, is this an act of desperation and grumpiness by National, or is it a clever strategic move? This, they, we, we got a visit from an old friend this week. Uncertainty means no action to fix the economy and lower your cost of living. The economic situation isn't dissimilar to 2008, when my government came in and guided New Zealand through the global financial crisis. We could only take decisive action because there was a clear result on election night and a strong mandate to get things done. And for those of you who weren't watching on video, uh, he was wearing a national sort of light blue golf shirt, really, wasn't he? he looked like a, a, a Lacoste. A Lacoste. He Lacoste. looked like he just wandered golf. in off the golf course uh, to, to give, to give that statement. 
So what is? How do you read that play? It's it's a it's very much a please Winston go away play. It, it really is, and I think it's pretty fascinating, and I think it represents a tro- a mop up from a strategic era um, from Luxon earlier on. He, he he ruled out the Maori Party. You might remember the Party Maori earlier on. I, I think that was half the hand that he wanted to play, and he and he was going to rule out New Zealand first. This is a couple of months ago. Didn't do that. Sort of got halfway. You know, sort of down the sky tower in his bungee, and and it, and it, and then slammed into the side Touched of the building. The end of the room. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and so I, I think strategically made an error there. Now he finds himself; he doesn't have the numbers, and he and he's wheeled out John Key. I don't think it's a great look, really. And I can't. I mean, a lot of people will listen to John Key, sure, um, big time. You know, he, he was an incredibly popular leader, and, and remains, uh, you know, a voice that people listen to. But I just can imagine Winston Peters making a lot of this in 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 the debates, and I know there's another one on on TVNZ, depending on when you're listening to this. But um, you know, the idea that John Key wants to keep me out of Parliament, him and the big money men yeah. want to keep me out of, you know, government. I, I think that'll play quite well to Winston Peters supporters, and I, yeah. I don't think he he's going to convince anyone who matters on this. No, no, I agree. I, I thought the main issue in the election was the cost of living. So why would you roll out the guy who's the chair of the ANZ Bank, who did over a billion? And profit after six months in 2023 is a guy who can talk about the cost of living. He says the economy is not going well. The guy earns, uh, you know, the the um, the the low wage in, t- in in two months. He earns over 40k. So to get the guy who's the chair of the bank to come out and talk about the economy is not going very well, even though it is for his bank, and the guy who earns a lot of money to talk about the cost of living. But, I national, it was a but bad nas- look. national wanted people to see him as that guy. It was, things were steady back in his day. They, they um, want to go back know, to he's, he's still a guy who's who we can trust with the economy, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they want to go back to two thousand and eight. I mean, in fact, their way, they want to go back to nineteen ninety. They get Ruth Richardson. But you know what happened in two thousand and eight? Nationals prepared to go with the Māori Party, then, yeah. right? And and to pick up on um, Guy's point, with the current polls at the moment, they could choose to party Māori over New Zealand first and still get a majority. Well, I don't right? yeah, I, I, and Key could have done that, but Luxon won't. Yeah, I, don't think that, do. I don't think that anyone who's voting for New Zealand first is under any illusions about what they're doing. This message is supposed to say, well, look, hey, you don't, you don't know what you're doing here. If you vote for New Zealand first, you might put a spanner in the works. The people who vote for New Zealand first... Want the spanner in the works? Yeah. That's what they. That's how they. The that's how they see him. <laughs> yeah. So they know exactly what they're doing. Well, and, and, it's, better, and it's the others. Who, and it's the others who are undecided. The supposedly squeezed middle. Uh, you know. It'd be my view and my view alone. If you're part of the squeeze middle, do you want to hear from the guy who talks like that, the guy who's doing well out of the economy, when you're not, to get you to vote against Winston Peters and go for national? I don't think that's going to work. I don't think they're talking to those voters. They're talking to the national voters who might think they're going to have a little bit of a flutter on the table, right? Who normally give them two ticks and might have thought, hey, I'll spread it around a little bit. Those are the people that they're talking to. I think they're trying to shore up their base and that 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 middle um, section that we've talked about before, the ones mm. that swung between voting for John Key and other people, which is why you would roll John Key out, right? Yeah. Um, and and to shore up that, because what we do know statistically, national voters, people who support national, are the most likely to give both their votes to yep. the same party. So they just don't want some of those people thinking they're going to splinter off and have a little bit of a which insurance or a could, fun or a dabble or whatever. Which could do more damage to act the New Zealand first then. Poten- if they're trying to suck the, the vote back well, into the into Well, the potentially. Starship. I mean, do we want to get technical on it? Let's, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, we do. Let, we do. Let, You've done this. You're here. This is what we're all about. This, let's, this is what we're let's here look for. In. Put, I've put my peepers on so I can see these numbers. So if we look at the spreadsheet from the Electoral Commission for the 2020 general election. 2020, yes. Yeah, so last election. We know that only 12%, just over 12% of National Party voters split their vote. And to give you a comparison, right, um, 78% of ACT voters split their vote. Yep. And <laughs> New, Zealand, <laughs> New Zealand First Party, 81% of New Zealand First voters split their vote. But it gets better because they actually analyse um, if you gave your party vote to national, who did you give your other vote to, mm. right? Yep. And yep. There's, just remember, there's a very small pool of national party voters who actually gave away their other vote. Right. So if we look along... Four percent of them gave it to ACT, two point eight percent roundabout gave it to Labour, and point three percent 
0.3% gave it to New Zealand first. You know, and if you want to take another example, let, let's take an example of a party that their voters do traditionally split their vote. Yep. Um, so let's look at New Zealand first. So people who party voted New Zealand first, 37%, just over 37% gave their candidate vote to Labour. 22% interestingly, gave it to the National Party. Yet you have a leader of New Zealand First saying that his preference is to form a coalition yep. with a party that fewer people who support him yeah, voted. Yeah, but that was 2020. Yeah. And that's they got, 2020. And so, so peak of the red wave. Right? Yeah, peak of the red wave. So do we want to look at 2017 national. then? Just sure. to give you a but comparison. But it's interesting. <laughs> just, just, oh, well, let's do that. Yeah, no. but, I, but I make the point that I, I'm guessing national think that they are potentially losing more this time to New Zealand first than they would have at the peak of the red wave. Even at 2017's election, yep. more New Zealand first When it was close, when, when, when National got the, majority, got mm. the largest mm. portion yes. of the vote, remember? So, New Zealand first voters, even at the 2017 election, more of them split their vote in favour of National, uh, sorry, in favour of, of Labour. Labour than they did for National. So 23.89%, so let's round it up, 24% gave a vote to Labour and only approximately 22% voted for National. So even, you know, if you take those two elections, yep. what that tells us is that in both of those elections, the people that party voted for New Zealand first were more likely to give their candidate vote to Labour. They have a, a closer affiliation mm. to Labour than they did yep. to National. Their leader, however, is of has, New Zealand first, has, um, you know, spurned, Labour out. spurned um, yeah. Labour. So, so, so is the scenario then that those parties could still uh, vote for, New, say, New Zealand first or act or, or whatever it might be for their party vote? but then give their candidate vote to National, which means that National could end up with a greater proportion of electorate MPs than the party vote they get because it feels like they're stagnated at what it is, 36, yep. 36 and a bit. Yep. They may end up with more electorate MPs than party representation they get well, on overhand. Which is a disaster for Labour because they lose some of the, a That's lot of right. those Labour MPs in their seats. That's right. And their list is, if their party vote is so low, then they lose them off the list as well and they get gutted. The other thing about National um, is saying that, you know, and, and you know, sort of like the shotgun video from um, Christopher Luxon saying, oh, if I I'm made to do this, I will. You <laughs> it's know, a shotgun I'll, wedding, isn't I'll, it? I'll pick up. Yes, it is. The groom, the reluctant groom here. And the father uh, of the bride is the is that six percent of New Zealand first? Yeah. Voters? Well, so if you if you listen to that video where he says he'll only do it if he needs to, right? He'll only do it if he, if he has to, if yep. he's forced to, because he doesn't want to make people suffer through another election. Um, he's going to do the right thing and call Winston Peters. And, and if that's his only option, hmm. well, this week another option presented itself. In Ireland, yes, right? it did. Let's hear from yeah. Raf Manji. It's Winston or Raf. Who do you want to deal with? I'm going to win Ireland anyway. But I think from a, an insurance perspective, it makes a lot of sense. And I think people need and want a new party in Parliament. You wouldn't stand aside in order to get wins, keep Winston out of Parliament? No, look, we're, we're doing a really good ground campaign. We've got a lot of support and we're going to keep, continue to work hard up to the 14th. I think it's probably a lack of strategic thinking, not just about this election, but about future elections. I think that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. It is a lack, and we talked about it before. I, I think strategically they haven't thought enough about how they are going to form a government. They've put all their eggs in the National Act basket and haven't thought about any of these other opportunities, don't seem to have built bridges with Te Pāti Māori or the, or the Greens in any form, and I know that's hard but um, for, for, for them to do, but haven't looked at, at, at top and, and now are falling short on the numbers. And to go back to the Winston point too, I mm. mean, it makes it very, very difficult, doesn't it, um, if they if they have to call him because they've said, we really don't want you and we've, we've warned you not to. So to have to make that call is going to be pretty difficult. It's a fickle electorate, eh, who forces that kind of government into, you know, the, the major party to do something they have so clearly said they don't want to do. Well, I think the interesting thing with um, Top is that uh, in the latest poll, they were up, right? Yeah, so they were two, two, two percent. Two percent. So if Raf Manji got an electorate, yeah. yep. then yeah, two or three MPs. Yeah, 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 depending on how the cake is yep. cut up, he he potentially brings in a couple of mates, it right? Would, which would be enough. Which could, which is a which bigger could, which yes, could, could be enough. using could these be, polls, using yeah. the existing yeah. poll, yeah. be enough. Could and, change. and it could be enough of an insurance policy as well. Like you know, you got a you got an yeah. ear and a spare in that scenario. Yeah, he'll give confidence and supply. He'll sit in the middle. He'll sit in the middle, but he'll give confidence and supply. And those. Right. And those discussions needed to have happened months ago. Yeah, you're right. 
and they didn't. And but, but the other thing is, remember yeah, that please. Raf, when he first stood, he stood against Jerry Brownlee. So he's very much an anti-national uh, movement when he first stood uh, as an independent in uh, 2014, I think it was 2017 for Ireland, stood in Ireland and, and missed out. He's very clearly said that, and I think he's hinted that he'll work and he'll give conf- confidence in supply national, but he'll sit in the middle. So that's kind of what you want, isn't it? You want someone who's pretty sound. <laughs> well, you've, got to, you, you've got to say that, I mean, Christopher Luxon, we should say for the record, has you know responded to Ralph Manchin and said, nah, yeah. ruled out, not happening. But you're right, if it had thought three months ago and you look at the scenario we've got now, if you're national and you want a secure and stable well, government, it's what MP, e, MMP is about, isn't it? Right? So, you know, you've got these small... It is in Europe. It's never... Has it been quite the same here? Well, do we need yeah. to grow up then? Well, really? I, think, I think we do because <laughs> no, of that. I'm, I'm because sorry. It, no, seriously. I mean, if you, if you were in Europe looking at those poll numbers that I'm sure Lisa's brought, brought into, the, <laughs> into the studio, you'd say, oh, this is a, this is, this is a national green government. Yeah, and because that's that's what Germany. Did. I mean, Joshua Fischer of the Greens in Germany was foreign minister for a long time, supporting conservative government. I mean, in in a genuine MMP, um, practicing it in a genuine way, that's the kind of thing that you would you you would look at. Yeah. Uh, we, and we, we we don't do that in New Zealand. No, we don't. And the National Party is saying no thanks to the Party Māori, right? And and saying um, that this is different to Party Māori to the one that John Key's government worked with. But I mean, if you look back to John Key's terms, he had a significant number of players in there with him on mm. confidence and supply arrangements. Yes. Um, and, more and, more and, than he needed, so yes, he played them off. Yes, so he more did. More than he needed. And, and, and if you look at it, he, he he built those relationships up. You might remember he, he said bef- um, well before that election that his favourite MP, because you know how they always ask you, who's the yes. MP on the other side you admire most? He said the, the best MP in the parliament is Peter Sharples. So he, he, was, he, he, he spent the time building those relationships up earlier, well earlier than he needed them and that's what you need to yes, do. Yeah. and he brought them in before he needed yeah, them, even in, in government and these arrangements and they all had different um, mm. they all had different, you know, confidence and supply and then true coalition you know, agreements, etc. And it's at that point that obviously the parties go in and they they lay out what they're prepared to, I mean, how many dead rats are they prepared to, to swallow in mm. order to get something? And Tsipati Māori got significant support for um, Fano order through yeah. that arrangement. They got a commitment that the Māori seats would not be jettisoned without... Yeah, and they rolled ref- over the seabed and foreshore legislation, yeah. most prominent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was massive. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. everybody, everybody sticks their line in the sand beforehand, but when you get down to the nitty-gritty and around the table, you can... You can, and history shows us, reach an agreement that you are all prepared. Miracles can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, but in this, but in sorry, his, his policy's baked in though. Yeah. I mean, he's and gone so hard on anti-co governance and Maori health authority, which are real. You know, they're stable policies for the Maori Party and actually for most of the parties on the left, but particularly the Maori Party. It's gone too far. And he, and he and can't pull them out. And he's ruled them out. He's ruled them out. He's not yeah. wrong that it is a different but, but, party, and, Maori, right? There yeah. is a very different. Oh, they party, are. They are. They are different. But but I think all of this comes down to uh, what we're talking about now and also rolling out John Key in, in the in the golf shirt um, is that National have just fallen short, you know and, and, and Luxon has campaigned pretty well in his meet and greets and things but to, to pull up in the sort of you know, high mid-30s is just not enough yeah, no. and that's, that's their right. problem and but, they really needed to be and I, well, I thought they would be um, in the late 30s, early 40s at this point, and they've like plateaued. Now. And so we're back, at plateaued. That, we're back at that 1996, 2002 election area where, era where the, the major parties are getting 62, 63% of, uh, of a total vote. Some of those other not parties. So Royal is still getting 1%. Why, I don't know, but they're still getting 1%. Is that the tax, legalized, that's the tax rate? Uh, legalized <laughs> cannabis is getting 1%. New Zeal, of Ringaro's new party, is getting 1%. And of course, you've got top on, on 2% as well. So lots of people are staying loyal to those parties, which they know they've got no hope of. I mean, even Top. No hope of getting a parliament, and yet they're still voting for those kind of parties or supporting yes, those kind of parties. To come back to just quickly on yeah, strategic yeah. voting, um, I, I think what we'll see in the Māori electorates is real strategic voting because, and Labour made the call, uh, you know, Nanaia Mahuta, not on the list, Kusha Tangaiden, not, not on the list, Sarai right. Mason, not on the list. Mm. I think you see Māori, you'll, you'll see uh, Māori voters go, we're going to push for the candidates in Labour and we're going to give party support to the Māori party to make sure they, they get over 3%. Yep. And I know in those polls they're only on two. I actually think there's underrepresentation of Māori voters in there anyway, but to get over 3%, so you get someone like Hanad Apati might be Clark, and I think you'll see a lot more strategic voting in those. In the most seats. So that's interesting. Does that take us back to the original point about grumpiness, right? 
which is this, that, <laughs> yep. that, and I'm not talking about the, the, the physical assaults and the home invasions. I'm talking about the general jump, grumpiness and malaise that, yeah. that arguably is out there among voters. And to Guyon's point about in Europe, you know, um, people have been able to do deals. This is part of why people are grumpy because there aren't these adult conversations happening between the parties and working through some of the bigger issues. And you see that in some of the feedback you get from listeners when you do certain interviews. They like elements of something but not of the other and can't understand mm. why they can't have mash-up. Yeah. <laughs> My 14-year-old keeps asking about when, when we're going to have a grand coalition well, in yeah. this country, right? <laughs> why, why, given, given how similar National and Labour are in this campaign, yeah. doesn't it make sense? But, you know, the... The answer to that, of course, is the damage that you do to your base over the next two terms. But, but you know, you're, you're right. People are looking for, I think, I'm not necessarily getting a lot of answers out of this, but the other grumpiness that comes into, we come back to, to pick up on Guy's point, is is the grumpiness of Winston Peters at the end of this. When he has been attacked so relentlessly by someone he then has to go into a coalition negotiation with, that's going to make for incredibly complicated and difficult coalition talks, especially when you've got ACT on the other side, who I was talking to David Seymour this week, he's still confident he will hold above 10% throughout, even though he looks like he's starting to slide a little bit. Um, and he will say that that's at least a quarter of the government, so he wants a quarter of the, the deals. Um, and, you know, to um, it's his m and moment, right? You only get one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow. Opportunity comes once in a lifetime. ACT is going to no- go... That's going to be some incredible coalition talks, right? Yeah, well, yeah. what is it? Eight, more than eight weeks? More than eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's the record so far. Uh, and I mean, are we all going did to that, be at did, the did end Did that of account the... the week that he went fishing? Well, that's what I was going to say. Are we all going to be at the end of the wharf waving him off as he, as he goes out he goes on his out boat? On the boat. But well, is... send him and, him and David out on a boat. <laughs> it's just sort of well, out. not all may come back. But, um, the, the thing it's like a god seed from the god's the, 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 What you have just highlighted is also what national is playing on in terms of a fear factor because there was a companion ad that went with the John Key video and the, and the sort of headline on it was Imagine and then it listed a bunch of things. Eight weeks of coalition talks, no clear election um, result or outcome. Uh, nothing gets done, you know, don't risk the uncertainty. Which all begs the question, why didn't he rule him out? Yeah. Mm, if you yeah. feel that strongly about it, why didn't you do that well earlier? And you know, that, 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 that was supposed that, to be less because, because that's what John Key did. Bungee jump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was, that, that, it that's was, what Key did in 08. And now they had to pull yeah. him out um, off the golf course this time and to roll him out on a social media campaign. When he think, was in but charge. It was, it was Labour who was supposed to be going yeah, negative in the last week of the campaign to yeah, try and yeah. get their numbers up. And so you've got the two major parties with failed bungee jumps hanging well, off. Yeah, <laughs> we talked about that earlier about, about not rolling them out because we thought it was a shrewd political decision because we didn't think Winston was going to get to 5%. And I know I asked us all about this four weeks ago and we weren't prepared to say. I think we can say because he didn't want him to get to five percent, and now he's there. He's doing a mad rush to try and convince the electorate. That's it's right. Prob- it's probably too late. I think the other really interesting thing is with Winston. It doesn't take a lot to get him grumpy nowadays. Although some people will say, this "Well, that's personal. always been the he case." He takes things personally. Oh, you know, all you have to do is ask him how much his policy costs, and he loses. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Next minute, Jack's out of a job. Next year, you know? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's have a very quick. Let's just go to that because we've got a clip. This is Winston Peters with Jack Tam on Q and A this week, and it does raise one issue that we wanted to touch very briefly on before we finish. Thank you, Jack. You've just made a hopeless case here. You've, a good you've, case you've rallied for us to, governance For us to make sure we get the broadcasting portfolio after this election. Is that a threat, Mr Peters? <laughs> no, it's not a threat. It's a promise that you're going to be, have an operation that's much more improved than what it is now. It's just an idea. Thank you for your time. Good luck in the campaign. <laughs> yeah, well, I believe that, good. Jack, like I believe half the other bulldust you just said. It's not the first time Winston shuffled his papers and walked out on an interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why is everyone looking at me? Um, he didn't no, hit the I, car park I think, that time. I, I think it, it was a great interview, by the way. It was, um, it was. But I think we do need to take that stuff seriously. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I don't think it's acceptable to live in a Outrageous. country where, where you are possibly going to be a senior minister um, and are threatening to, to, to take over um, editorial direction of, of a... Of, of a major media outlet, it's um, I think it, I think it's outrageous actually. Well, he did two back-to-back interviews, which were of the same tone. Uh, Rebecca Wright on News yeah. Hub Nation got the same kind of serve from him as well. Very bombastic, out of the gate, not wanting to provide any information when he was challenged.
challenged around um, race baiting. You know, he rose up like a python as well. On that point about the media, interesting enough, may he have an ally in Christopher Luxon, mm-hmm. um, in Christopher Luxon making comments about the journalism fund um, this week, saying, you know, he he wouldn't have... The former journalism fund for, has yes, now well, been spent. Well, well, but, but, but the whole point is, <laughs> hey, dude, um, that's no more anyway. No, the money has already been like spent. He was acting like it was still there, but he was asked by a, a person in the crowd um, what he felt about, you know, media organisations in essence getting state funding and did it muddy the water? And he seemed to be saying, yes, it does. And look, it's interesting that that from uh, something that is a little bit concerning from from the right, this election is that you've seen this in a few places. Um, you're you're seeing with Act and National both talking about putting a forty percent cap on judges' ability to decrease sentences, um, which is another area where. Often politicians have been very loath to go because you're supposed to respect the, the, the estates of government, the fourth estate that is the media, right? You respect the independence. Democracy works on the fact that the Stop media is independent. Stop being the table, Tim. I know sorry, you're feeling I, fiery I really about do. this, but you'll get in trouble. And they're sorry, you, I, I will. And the judiciary is the same, right? You're not, it's always there are, of course, boundaries around what, what government, parliament allows judges to do. But this is quite operational to start talking about 40%. Um, discounts and so forth, and to be quite prescriptive on judges. Yes, and you've also seen it in the Pharmac area where yeah. they are supposed to be an independent, um, you know, uh, organisation, agency deciding which medicines are funded because you don't want politicians making those decisions. Um, and yet we've had National saying, naming the 13 cancer drugs they want to fund, and just this week they said they'd fund continuous glucose monitors, CGMs for people with type 1 diabetes who are 18 and under. Now that'll be of great comfort to the uh, diabetes community who have have wanted that, but Pharmac have got a current um, negotiation process mm. underway for that, and there are two big areas there where National have just gone no, right down to the number. They said oh, we'll spend five point two million on it. So the negotiations blown. So, so mm. you know, th- there it is, and they've overridden Pharmac. Now I know there hasn't been much discussion about it because on the hustings, people are just like, oh yeah, that's generous or that's cool. But um, you know, once politicians start deciding what medicines get funded, you've got a problem, haven't you? Because you, you know, if you have to fund a type 2 diabetes drug where there's 250,000 people behind you, because that's how many type 2 diabetics there are, versus, say, Pompeii disease or a rare disorder where there's about seven people with a condition. Mm. I mean, where is that going to lead? You're going to start funding the medicines with the biggest amount of proportion yeah, behind yeah. them. That's why you have, lo- love it or hate it, and we've all done lots of pieces on, on Pharmac. I'm not saying they're perfect. I, I've, I've been quite critical myself at times. But that's why we ha- have it separate from the politicians. And I think as well as the cases that Tim's mentioned, that's another one where National have ridden roughshod over the independence of an agency. Yeah, limits leverage in negotiation. I didn't mean to appear flippant when we were talking about broadcasting in particular, you know, that, that interview with Jack, and, and Gohan's absolutely right. <coughs> uh, you know, it is it is um, beyond the pale going out and saying something like that. You know, the, the likely broadcasting minister in a national government will be Melissa Lee. As we all know, Melissa Lee was a long-term producer and presenter of Asia Pacific on TV as ever long time, so she gets a public media space. I'll also note that Willie said a couple of things about Jack Tame in an interview last year. Were, yeah. Yeah. Dissimilar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, and, and there were some concerns there. It, would he um, threaten to put him on Treasure Island? Or, 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 Celebrity oh, Treasure Island. Oh, poor, <laughs> poor old Jack, but mind you, he's not the only one that's been called jumped up by Winston Peters so he can join the club. But, but um, you know... Uh, I know um, that you all, <laughs> you all have stories about uh, ones of, uh, anyway. yeah, All of us included, but, but, but I just think that um, the question then becomes, does this play to his base and does this play to voters? Um, there might be a lot of people, I, sus- I suspect they're older, who when he says this stuff about Jack, go, yeah, way to go. Winston. They love it. Yeah. But they you see it. where this ends. This ends no, no, with no, no, enemy no. of the state Sinister stuff and Trump. Yeah. Yeah. And, and once Deeply you start cynical. convince, the problem is, is you better be careful what you wish for. Because yeah. if you convince people that the media are all just corrupt, then no one knows what to believe anymore anywhere. Yeah. And and that that's the problem that America's got itself into. So, yeah, OK, he's just firing a few shots there. But um, I think it's a dangerous game to play. Playing with fire. Playing with fire. I promise at the start of the podcast that we talk about the things that we missed this campaign. We've run out of time, so we're going to do that next oh, week. We've missed what we've missed. We've missed what we've missed. But it's probably a good thing to discuss in our last episode before the election next week. So we'll talk about things we missed and the state of the play then. But for now, we're out of time. So, uh, Matewa, thank you for being with us. Thank you.